Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome. My name is uh, Kevin Moorhead. I'm the Executive Director of Social Venture Partners, and we are thrilled to welcome you to a panel discussion on how uh, the charitable sector and the public sector can work together constructively. So uh, I'd first like to have a few thank yous, and I should just mention this is being videoed, but it's not a live stream. This is going to be uh, broadcast for those who are interested uh, after the session. So first, I'd like to thank uh, Bennett Jones for the use of this space, a very generous contribution from Bennett Jones. Uh, I'd also like to express my gratefulness to be able to live, work, and play in the beautiful city of Vancouver on the unceded territories of the Musqueam and Scarlet Creek and Squamish nations. I've always felt personally that the mark of success of any society is the extent to which it includes everyone in its prosperity. And I think we'd all agree that we have some ways to go before achieving success in Vancouver, and I am grateful to be in a room full of people who are committed to that pursuit of a more inclusive and prosperous society. I'd also like to thank us, all of you. Hey, good morning. I'd like to thank all of you. We have uh, a, literally a full house. <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time this morning, and it is really inspiring to be in a room full of executive directors of such amazing organizations and this feels like to me a very friendly space as I've had the good fortune to have spoken with most of you over the last three or four months since moving home to Vancouver. Uh, so what an impressive room full of people we have. Welcome and thank you for taking the time and of course thank you to the panelists. So let me quickly introduce who we have here uh, to speak with us today. First we have Quincy Kirshner who is the executive director of Kidsafe. Not safe kids, as my <laughs> dyslexic staff will put on my paper. <laughs> Quincy joined KidSafe in January 2018 as the ED. Uh, her background includes 15 years of experience in advocacy, government relations, and nonprofit leadership. She has worked with a diverse array of organizations, including political parties, patient groups, and coalitions, health charities, and nonprofits in the arts and social services. In previous roles in the health sector, Quincy has focused on government relations and advocacy working closely with government and leading campaigns for improvement to patient care and access to medically necessary medications and devices. Welcome, Quincy. Thank you. <laughs> Gordon Matchett is the executive director, sorry, CEO of Take a Hike Foundation, uh, an organization that uses the outdoors and adventure to engage vulnerable youth uh, in school, community, and mental health support. I'm going to let all of you refer to more about Take a Hike. <laughs> Gordon is a senior leader with over 25 years of experience in the nonprofit and corporate sectors and has earned an MBA, uh, previous roles in the nonprofit sector, including managing an outdoor center at the YWCA of Edmonton, being the executive director of the Boy and Boys and Girls Club of Alberta, and working as a business development manager for the Dalai Lama Center. He was also a financial advisor at a major Canadian bank, which gives an interesting perspective on the nonprofit sector. As a volunteer, Gordon has worked mostly in human services on the front lines as a knowledge philanthropist and on boards of directors. And finally, uh, Adam Johnson is the principal at the Earnscliffe Strategy Group. Uh, Adam joined Earnscliffe in February 2006. Adam provides government relations, communications, and public policy counsel to clients in natural resources, infrastructure, healthcare, and other key sectors. With over 20 years of experience, he understands key political policy and community issues that impact success for his clients. Now, interestingly, Adam served as the parliamentary director of parliamentary affairs and as the BC policy advisor for a federal industry minister. As a senior advisor to the Minister of Industry, he is responsible for legislation, parliamentary committees, appointments, and liaising with the provincial government in BC. Adam has also served as a policy advisor where he was the lead advisor on all policy issues for BC and nationally for energy, forestry, climate change, life sciences, trade with Asia, transportation, and Aboriginal issues. Prior to his public service, Adam was a senior consultant with a res respected global communications firm where he provided strategic advice to his clients on issues pertaining to all levels of government. Welcome and thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I was asked about six weeks ago to moderate this panel, and I was absolutely thrilled to do it. And I had three motivations quickly about why I was excited to talk about this uh, subject. First, I spent a long time working with the Aga Khan Foundation all over the world, and I've come to a, a 
firm belief uh, that a successful society empowering an inclusive path towards quality of life for all requires public-private partnerships, uh, and it requires much more robust uh, financial and intellectual uh, uh, capacities to work across traditional boundaries. And so I'm committed to this uh, in my lens as SVP now as well. The second reason though is that over the last three months, in conversations with all of you, one topic has been the most recurrent uh, uh, theme, I would say, from your side, from the nonprofit side, and that is we need more relationships. We need more deeper, stronger relationships with government at municipal level, at provincial level, at federal level. And so this is a topic that is clearly resonant uh, in the Vancouver community. And I think it's something that SVP uh, can add value to increasingly uh, over time. And so we're, I think the turnout today alone demonstrates uh, that this is a topic of interest. And third, just reading through uh, Imagine Canada's documentation over the last two years, one figure really jumped out at me, that they are projecting over the next 10 years a $23 billion social deficit. And that refers to the gap between the amount of social service provision that needs to be provided by the charitable sector and the ability to pay for it. A $23 billion gap. What do we do to overcome that barrier? Having said that, I think that this panel will be able to shed some light on how we can start <laughs> to get all the things <laughs> <to this hour. laughs> So I'd like to begin uh, not intellectually, not with big numbers, but with stories. And so I've asked the panelists to share uh, a personal story uh, about how they have been involved in a partnership uh, that has a positive impact on people's well-being, uh, the, the nonprofit sector and public, public sector working together. And I'd like to ask Gordon if he could begin with his story around the Take a Hike Foundation. So Take a Hike partners with public school districts uh, to offer our program. Um, we ask school districts to do everything that they would normally do for an, for an alternate student. Uh, they provide a teacher and a youth worker, and we layer on top things that are beyond the skill or beyond the funding ability uh, of the public school system. So we offer uh, mental health supports as well as um, outdoor activities and funding for those activities and expertise for those activities. We've been working in partnership with school boards across BC for the last 20 years, here in Vancouver for 20 of those, uh, with Kootenai Columbia, Burnaby, Delta, and Nanaimo. We're working on a partnership with uh, the um, Duncan School District, the Towson Valley School District. Uh, and we find this partnership really, really rewarding because we get to provide things that we really love to do and we, we are experts at, and the school districts get to do the same thing. We're also in a very fortunate space right now where we're able to afford to have these partnerships, but we know that as we grow, we're going to need to get more support from government. And so we were, were very fortunate last two years ago to receive some year-end money from the Ministry of Education, $150,000 to help us with our expansion. And then over the last uh, last two years, we've been really working hard to develop a relationship with, uh, with the Ministry of Education. Uh, we've had a lot of really positive success with bureaucrats, uh, executive staff members, uh, and we've been receiving a lot of support from MLAs and ministers, uh, but we've yet to see that long-term support that we really need to get out. So it's both been incredibly rewarding in terms of what we've learned about ourselves and our expertise, and it's been incredibly frustrating because it's not happening as fast as we want it to happen. Uh, we keep hearing, yes, we'd love to see your program uh, across the province, and then things don't materialize. So it's, uh, it's, it's been filled with highs and lows for us. Quincy, mm -hmm. I ask you the same question to share a story. Yeah, and I'll, um, we'll talk really briefly about sort of um, conversations with fundraising versus for advocacy. Um, and so I'll uh, have a look back um, at a time that the organization that I worked with was um, uh, working on getting insulin pumps funded in Alberta uh, for kids. And so um, this had been a, uh, a commitment that the government had made. And I think the really important thing um, that, we, that we know about government relations is like 
it definitely government will make commitments and that's amazing but budget time is the time that you have to be um, really on top of that relationship making sure um, that government knows that you're here and your expectation is that that commitment will will follow through um, but not at all in uh, an adversarial way in a in a real partner partnership way as in like hey we know that you want to make this positive change now is the time that it has to happen in order for that commitment to be met how can we work together to make this happen um so we did that in alberta and um uh, it ended up um, so funded for kids and it was a it was a big victory um it was also though a real a real great lesson to me about uh remembering to um that, that the commitment is kind of phase one of uh, work with government. Um, and phase two is all of the checking back in um, and making sure that that actually lands in the end in, in the budget. Um, and I think that, that whether what you're looking for is whether it's an advocacy project where you've identified something um, that your constituents or really, uh, your community really needs um, that you wanna push government to fund or do uh, or you're looking for funding uh, for the long-term operation of your organization, I think um, um, having that partnership uh, be created, but then also maintained and having those commitments come all the way um, into, into the end stage, which is getting your money in your bank account is, uh, or getting your little pumps funded or whatever it is, I think um, uh, the, the commitment is just maintained. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, Quincy, that's a good point. It is going a little bit off topic for a second. The power of uh, the Ministry of Finance and Treasury Board is a, a pretty important thing, uh, especially at the federal level of government. So eventually it's important to be focused in on you know, key ministries and building those relationships, but then understanding the process of government uh, is pretty key. Um, I guess I won't really get to talk about a specific story, but kind of three things that I've seen over the last 20 plus years. Um, our firm's worked a lot with the kind of nonprofit uh, sector, uh, both kind of volunteer capacity and, and as clients, um, anything from environmental to indigenous to community issues. Um, there's one similar theme I've seen across in the sector, uh, if it can be a sector, uh, is that everyone's extremely passionate uh, about the areas, uh, but are always like very under resourced. <laughs> And so um, it's you know really important for organizations to be very strategic about how much time and effort uh, they go down. Uh, we work with you know Fortune 100 companies, and they have you know 25 people uh, staff doing government relations, communications work, plus you know probably hundred thousand dollars a month of lawyers and consultants, uh, and they still get lost in the um, the pyramid <laughs> system that it seems with a myriad of of uh, different levels of, of kind of decision making and process inside all levels of government. So, um, you know, being sustained, being passionate about it is really key. Um, one area that, that I've uh, made an effort in, in my kind of personal and professional life is uh, politics and government relations can be a pretty type A, uh, aggressive uh, lifestyle so, um, and approach. And so uh, as a firm, but also in my kind of uh, political commitment, um, really tried to support uh, a lot of women, uh, especially young women getting into it, um, trying to bring diverse voices to the table. Because um, I think, um, you know, as we think about how we've driven change, but also how we want to collectively drive changes, you know, getting involved. I think a lot of people, especially the last 20 years, as I've been getting into politics, have been trying to get away from politics. And with social media, everyone just talks in these vacuums to each other. Um, and so it's been an interesting experience at my firm because we're a, we're a multi-partisan firm. And, um, you know, we've got people right now that are national co-chairs for Mr. Trudeau and national co-chairs for conservative candidates and advisors to, uh, to John Horgan and others. So um, we've always had this thing called Ernst Cliff Confidential. Uh, when I started at the firm, there was 14 of us and now there's about 85, so it's a little bit tougher. But um, we just, we have really interesting partisan and public policy conversations because um, I think most people that get into politics or, or government do it because they do have a strong passion um, for public policy. And so it's um, always trying to keep those conversations going and trying to create a better society. Everyone will have different visions of how they get there. But um, at the end of the day, you know, it's finding those champions. Um, the one other thing I would raise too is that we're seeing increasingly 
um, our corporate clients uh, trying to find ways to engage with community, trying to engage with nonprofits. Um, some of the later conversations I'll get into a little bit more, but um, you know, politicians are also trying to find ways to validate what they're doing and, and, and kind of break through the noise because it's so difficult now. People don't read newspapers, they don't watch the six o'clock news. And so how do they, how do politicians, but also how do businesses now figure out ways to communicate with people? And, and quite often it would be hopefully <laughs> uh, working with uh, people in this room to, to help validate that message. Awesome. I would like to actually turn quickly to the people in this room, because again, we were with a group of pretty impressive leaders from the nonprofit sector. Can I just get a quick show of hands? So how many of you are actively engaged in government advocacy efforts today? Only so only a few, about three or four of the organizations here in advocacy. How many of you access funding from the government today? Any level? At any level, municipal, provincial, or federal. So we're getting about four or five of the organizations present. How many of you would like to access more? <laughs> <laughs> Every single person. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to, I mean, I think this is the important framing point for this conversation is that I think that we all want to be able to access more, that, that this acknowledgement of the deficit is there. I'd like to understand a little bit more about why there's this enormous gap between a clear demand for services and an inability to pay. And I'd like to turn this back to the panel now. And maybe this time I'd like to go backwards, starting with Adam. Sure. Why do you think there is such an enormous gap between government's willingness to pay for the services and the demand for services on the ground? Um, well, I guess the if I was being a politician, the answer would be it's all about priorities, right? And, and there's only so much money to go around, I guess is the kind of easy answer. Um, I think. I think it, 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 and once again, I'm trying to sound partisan, I think it depends on who's in power too, right? If you have a, a socially progressive government, they're probably going to be looking to spend more. It's also looking what's going on in that government's kind of fiscal structure at the time, how much money they have. Um, you know, I'm sure the, the BC NDP would love to do a lot more than they're currently doing. Um, but, you know, from talking with my Democratic colleagues, they know that there's, um, they argue, a double standard with uh, the inability for a BC NDP government to run a deficit and what that would mean for their electoral re-election re chances versus if uh, a conservative government says, you know, we're tough times and we have to cut taxes and we have to run this massive deficit, you know, that that kind of narrow would be allowed. So, um, you know, I think it, it, it's timing. It's what's going on in the fiscal kind of situation. Um, and I think it's also um, really key to to find alignment um, with government's priorities. Um, you know, looking at having a strategy, having um, you know, going back to the Gordon Campbell days. Um, you know, he was very very keen on service plans. Ministries had very detailed service plans that they would issue. I think he was the first government in Canada to release that that information that was often very private. Um, and kind of uh, confidentiality. That has evolved now to mandate letters being released um, and um, speeches from the throne for another key area or budget. So looking for where there's themes um, that you would help to validate that narrative, show up with their, their issues, I think will, will help. But um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously just a big, big, I mean, everyone wants to support um, yeah. different nonprofits, but it's a matter of like, having groups um, either organized enough or, you know, talking about earlier, kind of organized enough and getting the timing right um, and even identifying the right type of program or if there even, even is a program um, for that area. Just before turning to others, let me follow up on one thing. I mean, the, this question of um, priorities is an interesting one. And the fact that the nonprofit sector seems to be the most comfortable political football uh, when, the, when the regimes do change, it's yeah. easiest to take a hit there. Whereas if you're talking about supporting the business sector or the military, for example, I mean, those are non-negotiables. Yeah. How do we move towards a point where the nonprofit sector is more of a need to have instead of a nice to have for the, from the government's perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's everything from the um, types of people that, that we all support and uh, get involved with and try to get elected 
Um, I think it's, um, um, and this is a, it's the tricky part of being engaged and showing alignment without becoming partisan. Um, you know, we tell our clients we don't prop up government, so we don't blow up governments. Right? Like it's just, it's not a good place to be. But if you are showing that broader, um, if you're showing that broader good, uh, and and helping to give those services, uh, then there's like higher likelihood that you won't get cut. Um, there's also this takes us down a different rabbit hole, but I mean, there's also a certain, I think, um, perspective of a uh, question of what, what a government itself should do versus what should be outsourced. Um, and that kind of sometimes comes back to kind of flip side, yeah. philosophical side that you might have a more left leaning government thinking that that should be a core service that should be outsourced. Um, so there's kind of a little bit <coughs> of that balancing act too. And, but it all comes down to trying to find that balance. Let me see, from your perspective, can civil society and the, and the nonprofit sector, if we turn a mirror on ourselves, can we do a better job of making the case for government? Absolutely. I mean, I think um, we, can always, we can always do better. One of the big things that I know um, about all of us in this room is that we are stretched um, in government relations. I know, you know, for myself, in my organization as well, there's a, there's a ton of planning. Um, a ton of strategy that has to go in. You can't, um, you can't just kind of go in cold. And and I think you need to really have you know, the best the best lesson that I ever um, learned when I was a little baby advocate um, going into one of my very first government meetings. Um, I laid out this very nice um, case. I had all my beautiful little leave behinds prepared and everything. And the very nice um, uh, MP that I was meeting with said, okay, great, but don't come here and tell me about your problems. Come to me with solutions. And that was, I mean, it's obvious, but it's such a, it's such a key piece of successful relationships with government. They don't just want you to come and they have so many people telling them about so many problems. Um, if you can package it neatly as here's this gigantic problem and hey, I've already figured out the solution for you and here's what it looks like, here's what it'll cost you and here's how you sell it. Um, I think if, if you've tried to put yourself into, um, into the, the seat of the person that you're essentially selling this to, um, you would be a lot more successful uh, than just kind of going in and, and doing the whole, you know, the, the world is collapsing, my, you know, the kids are hungry, like, that's my instinct is always to be like, how can there be hungry children? But um, I think you need to uh, go in with positive proactive solutions and a willingness um, to partner with anyone who wants to partner with you. Um, leave your, I, I definitely think, leave your parts and feelings and personal feelings at the door. Um, I always, uh, when I was particularly active in government relations, was, was proud of relationships that I was able to build with people, um, regardless of where individually we stood on the edge of that, on the, the spectrum of, uh, of politics and ideology. And I think that's incredibly important and really hard for a lot of us to do because um, a lot of us are in the trenches and have really strong um, opinions whether those are political, purely, you know, opinions about how the world is, is running. And I think it's really important for us to, to put those aside for the benefit of the, the organizations and the communities that we're advocating for. Yeah. Gorgeous. By the way, people can feel free, if you want to catch my eye to jump in, please feel free to intervene at any time. But Gordon, I know that Take a Hike is in the midst of some government negotiations at the mm -hmm. provincial level. And I know that my conversations with you in the past you've mirrored some of the uh, points that Quincy just raised. To what extent has your ability to access funding been dependent on the, the, the type, the, the proactive solutions-oriented approach that Quincy's mm -hmm. talking about? I'm just thinking about our, <clears throat> the first meeting that we had with the NDP, yes, the NDP government. Uh, we met with an advisor uh, the day before. He was the former deputy minister of education. Uh, and he said, these are the things that you need to do. You need to look at their mandate letters, you need to look at their throne speech, you need to look at the budget, you need to look at the service plan. 
And you need to look at those words that they're using and repeat them to the politicians that you meet. So we stayed up all night. We <laughs> poured through all of these uh, reports. Uh, we really figured out the language that they were using. We figured out the language that the Ministry of Education was using. And we followed the trail over to the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions and followed the trail over to, mental, or to health and the trail over to uh, children and family development. We really tried to understand what the language was. And overnight, we changed the way we talked about the program. We went from being a program that offered counseling to being an early intervention and early prevention mental health support that's embedded in a classroom because those were the words that they used. So it was really important for us to be able to get, get those words out. It was important for us to know what their priorities were and how we solved those problems. If I can flip on to a different hat for a second, I'm also the incoming chair at Vantage Point, an organization here in town that uh, helps with capacity and for profit network. Uh, and we had a meeting with the Deputy Minister of Finance. And our Executive Director went in and she was all prepared to have to do the fight to stand up for the not-for-profit sector. The DM of finance said, yeah, I know all of this. You guys are doing a great job. How do we work together? And we were all so impressed that that was the response. And so I really feel like there is the climate and the willingness with this government, but I'm not sure if there's the ability to fight it. Uh, interesting. I wanted to go back, Quincy, you mentioned something about uh, going in cold. And so I wonder if we, if we were to uh, create like a roadmap about how to start accessing government relationships, where do you begin? If you're an organization that does not have any existing funding streams from the public sector, either federally, municipally, or provincially, where do you start? How, how would you suggest we begin to map out the ecosystem of available funding and then start to make an approach? Yeah, it's a great... It's a, it's, a, it's a big question. It's a big question. I'm sorry, it's a very large question. <laughs> um, how long do we have? <laughs> I, think, um, I think, so first of all, I think it's really important for us to be thinking about what, what government funding actually is. So there, there are streams that a lot of us access, um, like HRSBC for Canada Funded Jobs, federal funding. That's, you know, who signs off on that as an entity in the area that you're asking? Um, gaming is provincial funding. That's, you know, the, the uh, MLAs uh, that are responsible in your area are the ones that are, they're signing off and they're writing you your letter after that says, congratulations on your, your gaming funding. So those relationships, the same deal with City of Vancouver funding, like all of those, there is a, those feel like grants that we just write all the time. Those are available for all of us to write. Um, but there's a there's a good opportunity there to do some government relations work as well because, um, for example, if you have a good relationship with your MP um, and HRSBC says no, we're, we're probably not going to fund you this year. There's not enough uh, not enough room in the budget in your riding, um, and, and your MP is aware of you and has a relationship with your organization. They can flag that. That's a that's a that'll come across their desk, and that's a thing that they can they can flag and say, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Um, so I think I think some of it is just about like it doesn't have to be sort of custom funding relationships for all of us. Um, some of those things are about using government relations to solidify our access. Um, and hopefully grow our access to those government funding streams that lots of us um, either are accessing or uh, should look at accessing, um, or potentially could look at accessing. Um, so when you say solidify, just to clarify, you're, you mean work, working together with multiple nonprofits? No, sorry, I'm thinking like, um, you know, you get your gaming, how many people here have, have gaming funding? Yeah, so like lots of us are receiving government funding, not necessarily thinking of it as government funding that requires um, GR work, but it is government funding, and GR work can be really helpful in terms of, of um, making sure that if something goes wrong with that, which happens, um, that our representatives know who we are. I mean, there was, it was just a few, few years ago that um, there were some pretty significant shifts um, in, uh, in the arts in terms of how gaming was going to be awarded. Um, and
and it was advocacy from arts organizations quite quickly building on existing relationships with government that that was able to save some of that. Yeah. Um, so I think like um, uh, it, it's good insurance for one thing to make sure that we have really strong relationships um, with with our government partners um, for things like gaming, for things like City of Vancouver. Again, those are recommendations from staff. City of Vancouver can make those recommendations for staff that goes to council. So if you have great relationships with your councillors, um, those are the kinds of things that can be a flag if, if something's going wrong or if you're looking to, to increase, uh, increase those partnerships and, and uh, step up your funding. Uh, yeah, I, it's a great point. I think, you know, when I was, it always amazed me when I was in a minister's office, the amount of people that would come to me with an urgency of some, and it was a big crisis for them, but had never had done any relationship building, didn't frame it up in the right way, and wanted, you know, me or the minister or the deputy just to drop everything and deal with it. And I understand why that was going on. At the same time, it's not that easy, right? So um, I mean, most, most ministers probably do seven to eight, 30 minute stakeholder meetings a day, then they're also dealing with question period, they're dealing with committees, they're dealing with, um, they're dealing with cabinet, uh, then they're trying to get reelected, they're trying to deal with their families, uh, you know, most, most of them don't do very well on that point, that's why there's a high divorce rate, uh, but um, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressures there, so you know, to come forward with solutions is, is really key. Um, I take a step back though and also say that I think it's really important just to have a, a plan. I know, back to my first comment about, under-resourced and a lot of good ideas and, and so on uh, in the sector, but they're really having having a short and medium and long-term plan, I think is, is really key. Um, I think it's um, it all starts with having trust-based relationships uh, with, with key decision makers. Um, I think it's also really important to remember that the politicians are always the tourists and uh, the bureaucrats are always the full-time residents. And so um, politicians, of all political stripes, everywhere in the world are trying to do one thing, get reelected. Mm -hmm. And so they will say and do anything um, to go there. Uh, but most governments believe in their um, officials. Um, there was maybe less of that case over a 10 year period, not a lot of years ago, but I think most governments in Canada now truly do believe in, in their public service. And so I, I you know, just also add that, yes, talk to your local MLA, talk to your MP, but really figure out you know, who is the manager level, maybe director level, responsible for areas that matter to you, then get to know the assistant deputy minister, but go in with, with um, strong background, you know, tight document, the language of government is PowerPoint. So go in with a, with a tight message about who you are, um, you know, how you align, um, you know, pay attention to party platforms, pay attention to, um, as others have said, um, speech of the throne, mandate letters, and throw that language back at them because ministers are responsible for going back, once again, through officials, back to um, either PCO in Ottawa or the, the Premier's office in Victoria to say, here's, you asked me, Premier, to do these five things, and here's how I've accomplished them, right? Uh, under the BC Liberals, uh, and I think several, I think in Alberta too, is a more kind of center right, right wing governments, they actually, ministers get 20% of their income held back unless they meet their, their mandate. So, um, and, and in Victoria, I'd suggest if you aren't meeting your mandate letter, you just don't get to stay in cabinet. It'll be you know, what happens to them. So, so looking to, to fulfill that, have those relationships built, um, and then and go in and, and listen. It's, it's a big listening exercise. It's, 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 it's talking, but it's mainly listening. And then, you know, that was another last thing I'll end on is it was just shocking when I worked in Ottawa how many people would, they knew they had 30 minutes with me um, or the minister and they would come in and talk for 28 minutes about <laughs> how great their organization was and all the great things they were going to do. And I felt like, okay, you can go back and your lobbyist now can fill out the spreadsheet saying that you've done that or you can go back to your board and say, you had these great conversations, but there was actually no opportunity there to have that dialogue to you know, bring someone extra long in the meeting that's just is reading body language when a minister leans in or she leans back and cringes, right? Like just, you know, be <laughs> paying it or barely on their phone, right? Starts to ignore, right? So it's all these types of things that all about, um, is the old football analogy, uh, you know, kind of move, keeping those sticks moving forward, right? Like just get, always get another meeting, always have another reason to follow up, um, have those relationships built. So then it doesn't matter if whoever's in power, um, your issue is, is getting further ahead, which, which really 
pays off for once. Yeah, that's such a that's such a great point. Keep following on that the the notion of having those relationships with your lenders, but to also for staff or like to even not change or not change as much um, the the bureaucrat side. So you have those relationships on both yeah. both ends. As sort of as I say, the other piece to it is you know sounding kind of like 1984 Big Brotherish. It, it um, there's a file on all these organizations, right? So like. A uh, uh, minister, where everyone changes, there will always be a file on your organization. And um, you know, I've had some clients that have had a lot of turnover over three or four years, and they go and introduce themselves, and the officials say, "Yeah, I was here. I met with you. And, yeah, I met with you. Yeah, I, but how? like it's it almost becomes redundant for them, and it's almost embarrassing that the staff is, of the company is learning more about their own organization from. So, so there's always a file there. So whatever you send in the government, you, you can never bring it back, and uh, <laughs> and just kind of. But having that conversation going will, will itself. Gordon, you've identified a, an amazing opportunity with the current provincial government, which again goes back to how fickle uh, opportunity can be in, in a government context. But let's talk a little bit about timing. I mean, how this is all premised on relationship building, which is a, a process of building trust, which takes time. What's maybe from your perspective, how long has it taken Giga Heights to develop the kind of trust-based relationships that would enable uh, large-scale funding? We started our GR activities about uh, about three years ago. Uh, we met with the uh, Liberal Minister of Education, Nick Bernier, uh, as he was packing up his office to uh, be re-elected. Um, we said, vote for us, we'll give you funding. We voted for him, he didn't get us funding. Um, but, uh, but we went back and started a meeting with Minister Fleming, uh, almost immediately after he got um, in power. And it was right around this time that we went in and saw him for, his, for, for our first meeting. Uh, and he was able to get us some grant money. So that was a really big win on our second trip to Victoria. Came back as heroes and set the bar really high for ourselves <laughs> that we haven't been able to get over again. And so we've been relationship building over the last, uh, last two years. We are really working with the minister. We're really working with um, NDP MLAs. We're also working with the opposition because we know that it might change at some point. And so we have lots of friends in the local government uh, and we just keep them informed. Every time we meet with the Minister of Education, we meet with the education critic. Uh, every time we meet with uh, mental health and addictions, we meet with their critic. And so there's lots of just very open and transparent information sharing. Um, and we also just are very clear to the minister that we're keeping their opposition out of the loop. Uh, in our last phone call with um, the staff that were getting ready for their, um, our meeting with the minister last week, um, they said, is there anything we need to be aware of? Are there, is the opposition going to ask us any question in estimate come up next week? And so they really know what our, our tactics are. Um, and because we've let them know, they can be prepared. There was a question. Yeah. Uh, my question is, since the nonprofit sector aims to really under-resourced, and since we, you had mentioned the arts kind of started to advocate, Adam, how many examples in Vancouver right now do you see in the nonprofit sector of folks coming together, whether that's like a segment of a population they're serving or an issue they're trying to tackle to come mm -hmm. together to advocate for government, not even just for funding, we're not also talking about policy influencing and shifting that safe space for anyone to come together? Or? How can we activate that if we want? Yeah, to it's a good question. Um, I think no, no, nothing pops to my mind immediately. I think it's it's um, as long as people are talking about a need in certain areas. Obviously, you know issues involving indigenous uh, people. You know the environment is extremely important. So there, you're seeing some um, you know coalition building, um, but. But really, it's I think having kind of a, a similar narrative. It's if there's a, you know, if there was a, a conference, um, you know, having having key ministers um, come to once again looking to who are, you know, key official in in maybe a couple of different key ministries to have them there. Um, maybe even having offering up uh, if if you thought Minister of Education was really key to a lot of people in this room to, to see if. You could request a meeting with with the deputy of, of, of education and talk about here are five things that would make a world of difference for people and here's how it aligns with 
with your garment's values. But that has to be like on the same page. Yeah, like, no, because I've been in, as soon as they go off, I've yeah, been in some real everyone, weird yeah. meetings where yeah. where yeah. you know groups of people are brought together to have these kinds of conversations, yeah. especially at the arts. Yeah. And um, and nobody's had like a pre meeting, so everybody's <laughs> like, "Well, my issue is this completely yeah. random off the wall it's, thing," and yeah. it, it's yeah. it's not effective. You need to be yeah, you need to be looking organized. The other thing is like so. People know the difference between year-end funding and budget, I guess. So uh, I mean, it's always going to get year-end funding, but then it's yeah, we've had a few clients have gotten year-end funding, and then it's the scramble to get that same funding. And one thing when I worked in the industry of Canada that was quite interesting was because we gave away a lot of money, a lot to the corporate sector mainly, and, and a lot of education. Was um, looking when when from the political side, we were saying this is a priority for the government. We should find ways to increase funding. Which like tourism was was a big area that to lead up to the 2010 games, we, we thought that would be a big push. Uh, and the message we got back from officials was, we cannot, we we don't recommend upping the funding to that level because we don't think the organization is ready to take on that funding. And so you know, as a sector looking organized, but also even just as an organization, being able to go in and say, here's what I would do with the funding, and have a really clear you know, business case or a really clear narrative about what you're going to do with that really helps to create that validation and, and look for that, that long-term and sustained funding. Um, the other thing is like, you know, getting capital for um, infrastructure versus operating. Uh, operating funds are usually a little bit easier uh, to get than, than kind of infrastructure, although there's more money once you get government priorities for putting more money into that area. But yeah, get, trying to get three years of sustainable funding is we always love to see if we can you can find if there's an actual program for you to apply for versus just, you know, I was just saying earlier about here's my problem, come fix it. You know, you want to be able to say, here's a problem, here's some solutions. Then working with that manager, director level person to say, are there even any programs available? What ministries might have it? Are there different levels of government that we need to go to? And then is there an application process for that? If not, could there be some funds put in through year end funding or would you guys create a new program to take this area on? These are the, Kind of process questions that, that really make a huge difference for your your long term goal. That, that point you raised about uh, not being ready to absorb the funds, and I think is important. Mm -hmm. Just one another statistic that jumped out at me when I was researching this is that eighty five percent of government funding for the nonprofit sector goes to one percent of organizations, mm -hmm. and that is because they're very very big mm -hmm. and able to absorb uh, the money. And so here's a tough question. Don't know who, to anybody who wants to take it on. And again, this is kind of turning the focus back on ourselves as a nonprofit sector. Should we be thinking about more uh, concrete partnerships, building on Amanda's point that can we can we do a better job collaborating, or is this just an old drum that just keeps getting beaten and it will never never change? I mean, what do we do to address this this issue? All the money's going to these big organizations. How do we respond to that as a sector? Oh, <laughs> I, I would say that capacity, so making, uh, like differentiating again between advocacy for our communities versus for our organizations, mm -hmm. I think there's a ton of room for that, um, for that partnership where we cross over in terms of advocacy. And that's a really easy one. Like if, if a, a bunch of us want to see some policy change and it benefits all of our different groups of people that we're, that we're working hard for, then I think it makes a ton of sense to, to collaborate there. I think you have to be a lot more um, specific about partnerships that would involve getting funding for a project or an organization. Um, and I think it, we, have to be, we have to be careful about, about the notion of um, what follows what. I always go back to this with with our board as well, like um, we want funding to follow mission, not mission to follow funding. So um, it, it's very important that we don't sort of, uh, in my opinion, and there are different opinions about this. I don't know that that my strong opinion is that um, we need to we need to be making really intentional choices about what we want to do and what we think our communities need and, and where there's partnership. That's great, rather than building partnerships and projects that we know we can get funded um, and, and aligning them with government stated priorities uh, as much
much as possible, staying up all night to do new <laughs> words and that kind of stuff yeah. for sure, but not um, not building these things, um, these coalitions or these um, these uh, big project partnerships in order to access funding, because then get the funding. Yeah, unless you're in the in the states where this whole industry is built now on people in my sector that go out and find initiatives to then they lobby to get funding for and then they get a big percentage of it and they kind of then write more and it's just crazy how much money gets spent on those in those systems. Yeah. And that's just how no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> so I, I, in terms of the big organizations being ready and able to receive the funding, I think it, it is very true. Um, but I think we, we as small organizations can do things to prepare for that. Uh, four years ago, Take a Hike was raising about $700,000 a year. Uh, this year, we'll raise about one point nine. million. Um, four years ago, our largest gift was, I think it was about $30,000 uh, from one of the people that had helped down the organization. Uh, this year, our largest gift was $265,000 that came with commitment uh, over uh, three years at the same amount. Um, and the reason why we got these commitments um, is because we did the capacity development work that we needed to do to get government funding. So we wrote a application to SVP, and we got some funding from SVP to take a look at what our theory of change is. We developed our evidence base behind our programs. We went out and got academics to look into the literature and say, yeah, we know your program works, but here's why. We got them to develop tools to measure our program success. Uh, we were able to reach out to our alumni and get their stories. We were able to work with PwC to uh, tell to determine what our social return on investment was. In the meantime, we were also doing things like developing human resources structures in the organization. We were developing uh, fundraising structures in the organization and accounting structures. And all the time that we were doing this, we were able to go out and talk to other folks. Um, we've now been able to get, uh, last week we announced a partnership with Coast Capital Savings, $300,000 over the next three years. They had been donating $25,000 a year up until for the last 10 years. Um, RBC is announcing uh, $250,000 over the next three years in the next few weeks. Uh, the money's already in and they're starting to talk about it, but they announced it's coming soon. And so by doing this work, we've seen a lot of benefit from our own fundraising activities. We've seen benefit from the people that we've been attracted onto our board of directors. We have had largely C-suite individuals coming onto our board of directors since we've been doing this work. Um, and we've also been getting a lot of response from the corporate community. Uh, folks willing to do either pro bono or low bono work. We're working with MMT right now on a very low bono basis to uh, work through our risk management structure, something that I know we all love, um, but it's a, it's a pain in our neck. And so they're helping us figure out how do we do this. And, they're, and we're working with their best people in risk management. Uh, and then we're also reaching out to Deloitte uh, to do some work on a pro bono basis around planning and how do we execute our strategic plan. So all of this capacity building work that we've done, for the government mainly, it, it's paid off in every other way. So if we never get government funding, it's a failure in one way, but it's a huge success in the other. We've, math is hard, we've, we've increased our, uh, funding by about 150%. Uh, we were able to increase the number of students we served in one year by 50%, and we're ready to keep going. Um, we've got a solid plan of how we're going to get up to $2.5 million within the next couple of years, and we've got research to support that, so the board says, yeah, I think we can do this. And so when I'm ready to say, all right, we need to add another fundraiser on, they're usually able to say, all right, show us the case, show us how your fund development administration percentages are going to come down over time, but we're willing to take this chance because we feel we can. It's worth carrying on. I mean, I think it's, it comes down to three areas. It's like, if you're a senior official, is it safe to give this organization the money, right? Am I, if, if the, you know, Auditor General looks through the books and says, why did they give $200,000 to this organization? Is there paper backing up that it actually did something? Um, are there good outcomes? So can you figure out how you're aligning with the government's values and how you're going to achieve those, and then how it's going to be communicated, right? How the how a politician or a government or or a, 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 a private sector partner uh, can go out and then leverage that that opportunity to, to show some better social outcomes. 
and you kind of match up those three areas, you'll, you'll get the, the three parts. I think some of the bigger organizations probably just have figured out some of these pieces that are crucial, but then also are out regularly talking to folks. But the power of people on your board, um, the power of, once again, having that effective government relations strategy with your short, medium, and long-term goals to try to figure out, you know, we call it key contact mapping, so figuring out who the right people are on the <clears throat> political and, and um, bureaucratic side we need to be engaged with and just, you know, regularly in touch with them, right? And so there's a cadence there of, you know, being in touch without being super annoying, without also uh, being in front of them all the time saying, why, you know, why don't I have any fun? Um, so it's all these different pieces, but having some of those, those um, pieces in your really helps. Yeah. Yeah. A question from Ferris. Just something that uh, came to mind when you folks were talking about how to make the pitch and, and where you're going to, uh, to present. Some years ago, I had a former leader of the opposition attend one of my classes at Federal League. And what he told me was, uh, at his level and the highest level, they don't like to get the answer. What they like to get is options. And, uh, and then through the options, they can then sort through them. So I was wondering, first of all, whether that is true from your experience. And if that is the case, whether one of the options is always, if you don't fund me, this is what's going to happen. Um, yeah, so um, that's always the ultimate. <laughs> that's kind of the, the ultimate, um, you know, card you can throw down. I mean, it's really want to be never doing government relations in a combative way. Um, you know, we also quite often have clients say, I need to meet with the premier, or I'm going to, I'm really angry, or I'm really excited about this, I'm going to write a letter, and I'm going to, it, it's, 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 it's looking for an answer back from the government. And that's when we always go, shit, don't do that. Because <laughs> you're going to get an answer back, and it may not be the one you want. So that's where I think it's really important about the key contact mapping, figuring out where you have those alignment, all the great messages, and then doing meetings with that mid-level official. Because, you know, ultimately, everyone always thinks, oh, I need to meet with a deputy minister, or I need to meet with a premier, or whatever. But he or she will turn to that assistant deputy minister who will know this much about the file, and then that ADM will quickly call or email the manager or director level where they will know this much and they'll go through the old file of every meeting they've done, they'll do all the analysis they've looked at and then they produce the briefing then. So if you're in regular dialogue with officials, officials also are, are quite overwhelmed. I mean, the public service has continued to shrink in Canada over the last 25 years. So if you're providing good information and you're making, it's almost like doing your taxes, right? Like. You, you don't want to be the person that the CRA is sitting there going, well, that seems a little out of line. Let me look for their taxes. You want to be the rubber stamp and just kind of things moving along. It's the same thing with government. You want to be, I've got an alignment with you. I've got some options. Here's some ideas. Would that work? And kind of floating it around with them and then coming back with a specific ask is the best way to go. So it's all that ongoing dialogue and, and trust-based relationships. So. I just think, you know, in some cases there may be options, and in some cases you may have like a real specific answer that they want to talk to. And I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would not. I think it's really important to remember not to be adversarial because it's easy to, an easy thing to fall into. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily. I would try not to be in a position where going into government and uh, and having to sort of throw down what's going to happen if you, if you don't fund us. Because um, hopefully we have that capacity within our organization that it's, that it's something that um, would be great for our organizations, but not that we're depending on. Um, because if, if we are, it is fickle, um, it can go, and uh, it's, it's important in the long term of organizations and institutions that are the one funder and the machine is one big funder um, to, to sort of And the other aspect to this too is, you know, George, think about preparing for this. I mean, obviously, money from government is always good, but there's also um, the ability as you're building to get validation. So, everything from having, uh, you know, partner with this this ministry or this crown agency to help kind of either get you in front of other funders or other, you know, um, public policy kind of uh, leading thinkers to help move an agenda. So, you know, don't think of government just as the ability. It could also be a communications opportunity and multi-profile raising. Absolutely. Thank you. 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 Thank you
And as we've been talking with the government, uh, we advocate for two things. One is for early intervention and early prevention mental health supports uh, for vulnerable youth. And we talk about the need throughout the province. And then we also give them the option of take either. And so because they've had so much increase in the amount of support that's going to vulnerable youth, uh, a 30% increase just in the education budget alone, um, we see that as a huge success for our GR activities. Uh, we'd like to see some of that come to us, and eventually it will. Um, but we do see these, these larger systemic changes as success as well. I'd like to throw it open to the audience. Does anybody have a question for the panel? Yes. I'm going to try to make it maybe a little bit blunt. Is it worth it? Our organizations are so lean, and it, the opportunity cost. When I think about all of this relationship building, and then government changes, and it's all just a, I guess, just feels like we've already kind of scratched it. And I understand that the back end doesn't change as much, and I we've wrestled a lot with this in our organizations. It's like, when is the right time, and is the effort we're going to put into that going to be better spent building other relationships with other people that might stick around a little longer? I think it's I think it's worth it, um, but there's different levels, right? Like to take a hike is really going very deep in the in the government going hard on government relations. Um, I think it's worth it to like again meet with your MLA and your MC and make them aware of what your organization uh, is doing in your community for their community, what the impact is, that kind of thing, um, in order to support some of that um, some of that fundraising work that we're doing around the different levels of funding that are being sort of set, federal, provincial, and municipal. Um, I think that's a good kind of baseline. Like that's where I'm at with Kids Safe right now um, because I'm not ready yet to go to government and say, actually, this is, this is our big plan. This is what I want to do. This is how we want to get there. This is how we want to help. I, I, don't, have, um, I don't have all of that mapped out yet. So it would be foolish to go in and do that, but we're at the stage of like making sure that our elected people know the role we're playing in their communities for their kids um, in their constituencies. Uh, so I think like that's that's always worth it. Um, that's my opinion. I don't know if that's the, different for you guys, but the the um, the bigger stuff, I agree. Like you have to really really think through the amount of um, effort and time and human resource um, is limited in all of our organizations, and so I don't I don't know that 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 I can say that that would, in my opinion, be worth it for everyone going going down a bigger a bigger sort of more structured wider road because because the return on investment might not be there. Can I can I add to that in answer to that question? Um, I think. I think that question is a really good for me. It depends on what the end goal is. Is the end goal funding or is the end goal policy change? Because I think if you're looking at it from a policy perspective, then that will be with the effort with funding and perhaps there's other funding opportunities that you could use. Yeah, you know, we've you know had some nonprofit clients that, you know, would say that take the amount of grant writing it takes just to you know, fill out the applications is like half or more than half the amount that they actually get at the end of the day. So yeah, I think it, it, it depends on the organization. At, at, a, at, a, at a minimum though, you know, sending in a letter to the, the yearly update of what your organization is doing to the minister and to the deputy minister in a key ministry, outlining things that gets it into the system. You could put a soft ask in that if you ever want to meet or talk about this, and you'd be surprised what you'll get back. Um, you know, and then, and then, yeah, finding some MLAs that you think, or MPs that you think would be passionate about it too, um, and just keep things, keeping them lightly informed. Um, usually doesn't hurt as well, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of how much effort you want to put into this is really how much you get back, but it really starts with kind of that, that you can use a soft touch on it. Can I add on that too, because it's gilded story? 15 years ago, our founder wrote a letter like that to the Minister of Agriculture saying, hey, I want to start this project. Got a check in the mail for $10,000. And that was it. She got a check for that. Hey, here you go. And that's how we started. 
and you know, I don't have a job yet. So those letters yeah. didn't pay off. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say even if Take a Hike doesn't get government funding, we've reached a whole bunch of benefits from the large announcements that we've been making in the last year uh, to the friends we've made in government. Um, politicians all have very broad networks uh, and they love to talk about Take a Hike. Uh, because it's a very good news story, as are all of our organizations. And the more they can talk about good news stories, and the more they can share it, the more they can tweet about it, the more people that understand us, and the more receptive people are. So the the win might not necessarily be money in our pocket. It may be more friends that leads into donations and other things. Uh, politicians have often had large careers before they get into politicians. Some of them have, some of them haven't. Uh, and the ones that have had really good careers before they got into politics, um, they've been willing to help us with their connections. And so some of the grants that we received have been influenced by people we met in politics. Yeah, I, it, sorry, it's I, I, kind of a general example. Like we, we do a lot of work with um, on the LNG, liquefied natural gas. And um, you know, it was interesting. We had a few clients where the energy minister um, was talking to an organization, or sorry, the, the, the opponent was saying to the energy minister, we, you know, we were committed to, you know, supporting the local community, to like all the good things about being actively engaged in, in the community. And, you know, the minister started calling back to some of our clients and saying, okay, I've heard about this organization that's helping train indigenous women um, at UNBC are you guys willing to put some funding in on this? And we and they said yes. So we started kind of kind of check. So that that also can kind of from roundabout ways start to get you some influences. It's important. I just wanted to loop back. Amanda asked a question about whether or not there were sort of sectoral advocacy issues, and I I do think that all not for profits, regardless of their size, should be looking for those organizations like Vantage Points or other. Um, uh, volunteer Canada or um, to uh, to sort of sign on to advocacy platforms that they're forwarding because um, it will become relevant for small little organizations when there's a bigger space within government to hear from not-for-profits and so even though it's not my job in my organization to push for the sector as a whole there are organizations doing that work and so I always think about how any government relations, any advocacy work has sort of two prongs. There's sort of like my organizational needs that I need to pursue, and there's also sector-wide needs, and they're gonna be different. It might be joining on to an advocacy letter that an organization is writing to government, um, or be willing to give, you know, be, uh, give some testimony relating to an advocacy issue that they're providing, and that could be really easy, a couple hours of work in a year. Um, but then your name still is in front of government on something that is more strategic, you know, sort of str strategically aligned for you um, uh, relating to the sector as a whole. And um, I uh, run uh, a bunch of social service um, programs for youth experiencing homelessness by and large. And, um, and, it, and one of the issues that I have is around hiring folks. Like we, I can't afford uh, the city. I can't afford to hire anybody. We don't get enough funding. Um, so that isn't specifically an issue relating to youth homelessness, but it is an issue relating to every organization in this part of the world, or maybe across North America, uh, and the um, you know kind of the social service sector. If you're in the helping profession, if you're a helper, you're not get you're not paid you know to to live and survive. So how do we influence government around that? Around this being really important work, whether it's daycare providers or those looking after seniors or people with developmental disabilities or youth with you know experiencing homelessness those are conversations that I need to be a part of so that you know even when I'm long gone <laughs> when I'm retired somebody doing this job maybe isn't struggling as hard to hire folks and pay them enough that's a really really good point because that gets back to um, building trust-based relationships right like if you're always coming forward with um, an ask for money. <laughs> um, then it's like, yeah, get in line. Everyone always does that. But if it's, you know, here's some of the broader issues we're trying to address, yeah. then it's like you're, you're actually coming forward for more than just a lot of reason, which will help in your organization, but also help that broader. Yeah, and, you know, I think the corporate sector 
or isn't just successful in their lobbying efforts because they've got a lot of money to throw at it. It's because they really do work better together um, uh, sectorally sure. yeah. to uh, to make uh, pitches to government. And um, and I think the not-for-profit sector, despite the handicap of being so short of time and money, could do a better job at that. Um, and it's it's a slow burn, right? But just sort of always feeling like you've got your hand in one pot of some larger advocacy effort is, I think, a smart way to go. If I could build on that, what is going on with the Senate committee report for the charitable sector? I mean, it came out last year with 42 recommendations. I mean, as a sector, how can we keep propelling that forward? Or they just dropped this report with sensible adjustments. But now what is it doing? Sitting there. Do you, you know what, Adam? I don't, What's going but on? I'll, 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 I don't know, but I'll talk quickly. Um, <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I, I would, uh, well, I mean, obviously, so I assume that report was tailed before the last election. 1929. Yeah, so before the, yeah, so the last election. So then everyone went away, then, you know, there was a non-eventful federal election, and then um, you know, a few issues that happened. So I would... I, you know, if you guys are interested, I would go back to whoever the chair of the Senate was, and I would I'd email him or her and say, hey, I'd like to find out what's going on and see, look at, or, or the, there's a committee clerk that would probably come back. Um, so yeah, I would just, once again, start a dialogue, see where it goes, see where it's gonna go. I mean, the, obviously the Senate can be uh, ignored more than something comes from the House, and, uh, but, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on and forget it's just all all political parties are looking for a coalition, right? So they're trying to figure out who's the group of voters I need mm -hmm. and in what areas, right? You look at the conservatives, they had a very strong, aggressive, passionate group, but the problem was that most of them lived in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, and so that wasn't, you know, electorally that effective for them because they needed to have those votes spread out to other areas. So every, you know, in the next election, the Lower Mainland for provincially is going to be really crucial. We'll see what happens with the Greens and how, you know, um, decisions around LNG impacts kind of that left uh, environmentally progressive voter that may have been with the NDP before. So, um, you know, the BC Liberals are going to look like, have to look like they, you know, have a little bit more of a social conscious and then kind of care less about the economy and more about, you know, people and, and affordability and all the different issues that, that we saw play out over the last three or four years. So. So every politician is looking for, every political party is looking for that coalition of voters and how to show alignment with that group. So that's where you guys can kind of kick in. Um, and then also, you know, MPs and MLAs, uh, especially in minority governments, have a lot more power than in, my, in majority governments. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's going to change. When I worked, I worked in the Paul Martin government, uh, which was a minority government, um, but MPs had less of a say than than they do now. So I know if, I, if an MP or an MLA calls a minister, they're always the priority meeting. So um, finding some champions is important, working with, with the bureaucrats, um, and then helping to kind of elevate the message that way would be important. But you know, maybe a senator has a passion in these areas. You know, some of these things can be ignored, but literally if you emailed the clerk um, or, or the last chair, You'll, you'll That's my action answer. item, everybody. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the good news is that the uh, under research on topic sector is increasing all the years as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is anything on the advocacy, like advocacy, um, is a real sort of area of interest for me, and I think a big piece of that is the finding places that we do overlap that are that are specific. It can be difficult because, you know, with advocacy. I, I really believe that gaming gaming what you're asking for out to the end is really, really important because often there's, you know, there could definitely be unintended consequences to getting exactly what you're asking for. Um, and I've definitely had conversations with people where I've been like, okay, but the end, the, the end point of what you're asking for would have this result. And they'll be like, oh, well, that, that, it'll never happen, so that's fine. And I think we have to be quite careful who we who we align ourselves with um, in terms of, of creating advocacy partnerships because that can be dangerous if somebody's end, end goal is a little different from yours or not something that you want to sign on for. But if there are areas where specifically you're aligned, um, I know in health, like uh, PharmaCare was a, a sort of a coalition.
intervention area where um, a bunch of different healthcare organizations could come together just on this one piece of the thing about you know what are our three asks to um, improve pharmacare in BC and the experience of, of patients who need medications and, and, and could come up with this very diverse group of um, patient groups and mm -hmm. uh, health charities could come up with three priorities like that. Um, that's quite different from signing on to a big uh, group that's going to advocate for a whole bunch of things, some of which may not be in your interest or, or aligned with um, uh, your organization's uh, mission and beliefs. So uh, I think it's if, if there are specific issues that you can kind of come together on a, on a time sensitive um, way to create a, a little uh, a group and sort of push specific advocacy <laughs> things together, bless you, um, that might that that's a good way to move things forward as a group without sort of endangering yourselves by by attaching to other organizations that might be going in your direction. And it's because it's kind of a general statement. It, it also depends on the areas that we're targeting. Like if it's if it's education or health, um, you've then got you know you got um, different social services organizations, but you also have uh, school boards and health boards involved. And so there can be quite easily a lot of kind of, you know, it's not my responsibility in a lot of this, which can be frustrating, but also they have to kind of figure out that side. So it's more like a pure you know, social services ministry and that ministry can make a decision on something that, that might be a bit easier. But, but I think coming forward with, you know, if there is, if health is a major area, um, you know, finding three or four voices that um, could come forward with, as I said, the five things, here's five things that we could, we could align with and how our groups can help you on this, and sending in that letter to a, a deputy minister, Stephen Brown, who's been at health for a long time. He may meet with you, but he may actually send over an ADM and, and a couple of the CPP health authorities for you, and they'll sit in the round table on this, and I bet you there'd be pretty good outcomes. But yeah, not ha having an aligned message really makes a, makes a big difference. Message rather than aligning in front of a line of entire organization. Yeah, no, more what you would never get. Other key points, questions? One topic that really interests me is trust, because I've also been reading that trust in the nonprofit sector, despite the optimism here, which is great, is actually declining uh, amongst individual givers as well. Part of that might be around the narrative of impact. So, Gordon, I want to ask you a question about impact and how we express or articulate the results that we hope to achieve to the government. Specifically, do you have any thoughts about what is there an effective formula? Is there an effective narrative around impact that you think is most uh, effective work for this government? So what I understand is this government is different than the last government in, kind of, in terms of how they want to hear about impact. Um, they always need the business case of why this is going to work. And so that's why we worked on our social return on investment. We learned that for every dollar that's spent on take a hike, society saves between $5.60 and $15.80. Uh, we learned that most of that is due to the education uh, education impact and the up, up rising of the student's income over their lifetime. Then when we just looked at just the mental health components and the uh, physical health components, we found every dollar we spend, we get at least $2 back. So we showed a lot of good return there that they were able to say, ah, we're going to save money. We're going to save money in five years because of this. So that's the one piece that we needed to do. The other piece that we need to do is be able to tell the stories. And so we've produced um, some professional uh, quality videos. Uh, they were produced by Maria LaRose and Associates. Maria has been working in uh, the mental health sphere for a number of years as a reporter on CBC, uh, and now works with a lot of not-for-profit organizations. Uh, and she produced the videos that really capture our theory of change and really help bring those pieces up to the surface and that she helps get the students to say the words that are impactful to the government and to key members. Um, so really getting that messaging out. And then also having those key measurements that people really understand. We know that graduation rate is the one thing that people really uh, are listening to for Take a Hike. And we say 97% of our grade 12s graduated last year. We go, wow, that's great. Uh, when we say, the average student doubles their attendance and take a hike, but most students increase their students their attendance by four times. That's another thing that people really understand because they get 
that graduation leads to better outcomes, better, better attendance leads to better outcomes. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the trust issue is an interesting one, and we, we all hear um, a lot about, you know, the charities that are spending a huge amount of money on, on fundraising or on administration or whatever it is. I think we've all, um, it's, it's a little bit hilarious, that sort of the parallel between when I think about how lean we all are and how, um, how, much um, of the, the sort of drive and sweat and tears of our organization goes into the mission and goes directly into um, the results. And I think what, what we have to do is a better job of, um, of explaining impact in a way that makes sense to people and of, of, of figuring out what, um, what priorities are in our audience, whoever that is, and then figuring out if we align and how we align. And in most cases, most of us will in some way. We just have to sort of think open-mindedly about, about what it is um, that that our audience, whoever it is that we're talking to, whether it's government or a, you know, a foundation or an individual, um, how how we talk about what we do and and what uh, what we want to bring impact as. I had a, um, an interesting conversation which is kind of the opposite <laughs> of what you're talking about um, recently with one of our one of our major donors where we're talking about the fact that you know for our families at Kids Safe, um, it, you know often we keeping in touch with families over the course of a break time is hard because um, phone numbers change um, you know things happen it's a it's a very um, uh, fluid situation for lots of our families and I, I imagine it's the same in, in lots of your organizations and so when we talk about impact uh, one of our the chair of our board um, said one time at the very beginning of my time at KidSafe we're all talking about impact and talking about graduation rates and all of that kind of stuff and he said you know I think we also have to remember um, the the very important benefit of a happy childhood and that sort of took it back for me where, you know, sometimes that's the impact that we need to, to be explaining to people. Sometimes it's about telling that story and explaining um, that, you know, here are some concrete results, but also here's, here's what we're seeing on the ground and having kind of having both of those, um, especially when for some of us, like the ability to, to express some sort of longer term outcomes is going to be compromised by the size of our organization or the population that we're working with. We may not have access to all of that stuff, so so it's framing impact around framing that impact around each for ourselves in terms of what is important as an organization. Does that make sense? That it does. And I was going to ask from a if Adam to put on the government hat here, sure. the, our, our yeah. government representative. Yeah. Is it is it emotion? Is it rationality? Can Gordon mix the two? I mean, what what really it's, resonates? It's it's a bit of both, and it's your audience, right? It'll be once again the official that that manager director level official that is responsible for looking at different programs and options to try and meet the goals that are outlined in that uh, mandate letter. Um, and you know, just once again, being in front of that individual so they go, oh, okay, that might be a good alignment on this. Um, they're gonna have to ultimately be able to show that the organization can have good outcomes. So even, even the fact that you're talking about that and maybe even posing a question to an official of what would you like to see to help ensure that you're getting the outcomes that you want and, and, and kind of proof up um, these areas. So I asked that question earlier. And once again, that's where, you know, the formal letter to the minister with the ask versus a former letter with here's what we're doing and can we have a conversation and kind of getting into that two-way dialogue and then coming back with a formal proposal will be helpful. Um, on, the, on the political side, um, and, and I don't mean to sound crass, but like they're gonna be much more interested in, you know, that kind of the, the broader goals that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and they're gonna love that communications opportunity. And I think we're all guilty of it just in this room. Like, you know, if you see a video that's four minutes long, you're like, oh my God, four minutes. Like, can't, can't you say it in 35 seconds? So like just, you know, having a tight, crisp message that um, shows the outcome. People love stories of, you know, an individual and then backing up with some stats in a speech. It's really powerful. It's something that then can be pushed out through uh, digital channels is, is really, really important. 
We have time for one more question from the group. Anybody would like to interrogate the panel? <laughs> In that case, I think that we were going to wrap this up. Now, I would like to, because we have a few more minutes, I would like to give each of you the final opportunity uh, to summarize what you think was in the last 90 minutes, what have been the key takeaways from your perspective? So uh, I think from my perspective, I've learned a lot. I'm pretty sure you have too. So I start with two takeaways from the last 90 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's always an amazing to, to sit and hear these perspectives. This is super valuable uh, perspective. Um, from, you know, that, that we can scale online for, to be honest. <laughs> um, so it's really amazing to, to have the, the opportunity to sort of hear um, from that end of, of things. Um, very often, I don't think that um, all of us are, are kind of getting access to that kind of um, uh, perspective and information, so I'm just grateful for that. Um, and also, Gordon, I think, like, uh, the work that you guys are doing is amazing. Um, piece of like building the capacity um, to be the bucket that government can put money into in a way that's safe um, is is something that I think is, is interesting probably for all of us um, because it's that like the all the pieces that get along the way um, how they're going to sort of be the ones that make that capacity happen. I, I, I hope that all of us in our sort of various sized organizations don't feel Kind of intimidated by the, the bigness of the work um, and the potentials of GR because I do think, um, as you were saying, like any any little small bits in terms of those relationship development pieces um, can can help in the long run. So I hope that um, I hope that we can all sort of feel encouraged about that rather than um, just intimidated uh, when we try to you know, post small different jobs at a time um, because there are all these little ones and if there are pockets in the community we can kind of be small pieces of that so thank you don't go it alone uh, is kind of what's come up for me uh, today uh, in the conversation around forming the alliances within the sector or joining existing alliances uh, finding friends to have messages to go with uh, is super important. Um, but then there's also, the, if you are going it alone, don't go it alone, have people to advise you. Uh, and have people like Adam, um, have people who have served inside before and are now outside. There's lots of those folks uh, around that are willing to um, give support. And there's lots of folks that have been through it before that are willing to share their own wisdom. You know, I think it's a really good dialogue. I think um, it's not surprising that the question of is it worth it and how where to start and all those kind of things. It's 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 a very you know common and probably practical question to ask. Um, you know, I think it's if if different parts of this sector can come up with some common themes and areas where it could be helpful. There there is um, I think I think there's receptivity at the well all three levels of government right now. Uh, and then also on the private sector and, and kind of around the agency side, there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to communicate and how to do the right thing and realizing that there's a bunch of things in society that need to be improved. Um, you know, I know that, that people that are close to the prime minister kind of um, you know, looked at what's happened with Brexit, what's happened with the election of Donald Trump, uh, and have kind of realized that um, there needs to be, you know, a significant look at what's happening in society and some of the long-term planning. So I think if you come forward with a message, he talks about, you know, coming forward with a message, here's what I need for my specific, you know, uh, organization, but here's where I think it lines up with some of the broader values and how it helps. That'll, that'll be a really powerful conversation. And I think that there, there's going to be a very receptive ear to it, um, but it's just a matter of kind of that, that timing and the sequencing. But, um, you know, sorry to sound like a broken record, but, you know, look at find, where you find alignment Keep your message really tight and specific around here's what we do as an organization, here's how we align with you, and here's some areas where we think we can work with you going forward. And figure out a couple of key ministries, send a letter to the deputy, send a letter to the minister, and you'll be shocked what you get back and just start that conversation. 
Um, and if it kind of becomes too overwhelming or too much or no value, then you just turn the tap off and go focus on other things. But I think you guys are all going in the right direction and it's just a matter of, of trying to find those receptive ears and just be really patient because it does, it does take time and, and do more listening than talking. I love your idea of sending a report, like an, almost an annual report. Yeah. I've never thought of doing that. I don't have a lot of direct contact with government. Um, we just send it here. Yeah. But I never would have even thought that would have been productive in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I'm going to do that now. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. thank you for that. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, like, because for people, like I said, people don't realize that you send a letter in. It rarely the person, well, the the deputy or the minister, or the minister may read, but the deputy definitely will. A glance at it and she will say you know you get fired off and then there's someone who's actually responsible for your area that will actually really get into that do a whole bunch of work and thinking about it and you'll be surprised if you throw an email or phone number at the bottom and, and both reach out to each other so it does it does have an impact yeah the other thing i was going to quickly mention and it came up very briefly but the government funding for summer youth positions it is really valuable uh, we get about eighty five hundred dollars a year it has to be a position that is only, that you're not gonna have somebody filling unless you get that funding. Mm -hmm. That's the criteria. I think the deadline is Feb 28th for youth that is in. I don't know if anyone here is sure about that. But if you don't have an application in, I think you still have, oh, was it? Oh, shoot, okay. Because <laughs> it's really worthwhile. We've done it for the last three years and it's just made a huge difference to a very, very small church. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, these unintended consequences of relationships are more than I can think of. I think that as you've all stressed, great things can happen when we do start proactively communicating and working together. And so that was really the spirit of why we brought all of you here together uh, today. And I hope that this session leads to some more dialogue, both between the sector and with some of our experts and with the, the government. And so one quick plug for SVP, this area of government relationships is going to be an increasing focus for us uh, as, as well. And we hope this is not the last time we will be convening uh, around this topic. And so thank you all so much for coming. And can you please join me in applauding the panelists?